Okay. So good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everybody who's joined us for the relaunch of Amherst Community Chats, where we'll be talking with different um, department heads or um, town employees, um, area employees, every Thursday at noon. So today we um, are joined by Town Manager Paul Balkelman, Acting Public Health Director Jennifer Brown, and Director of Senior Services Mary Beth Ogalowitz. Thank you all for being here. So before, um, before we launch into Q&A, I'm just going to remind folks that if you'd like to make a comment, you can raise your hand in Zoom. For those of you who are joining by phone, star nine from your phone, or feel free to use the Q&A function uh, within the Zoom application. So I am going to invite the town manager to give any updates he might have. Thanks, Brianna. It's good to be back, actually, um, to do these things. I think they're very useful and helpful for us to hear from people um, in the community about what their concerns are and answer any questions that folks have. Of course, the big news for us, uh, well, two big news items last night. One is we have the power, the windstorm that came through and knocked down a lot of trees. The crews are out. They were out all night. They're out th throughout the day. I think about 10% of the town is without power, nearly a thousand customers of Eversource. Uh, they are, I have not had an update recently, but I think they're trying to get as much done as they could during the course of the day. Um, town, certain town facilities are also working on backup power. So it's a pretty um, all hands on deck moment for uh, our DPW crews and um, fire and police were running like crazy last night, responding and closing down roads. Um, Several of our roads are still closed. Um, so. Uh, that's one thing. And the second was that uh, yesterday, last, late yesterday in the afternoon, the state announced that the town was moving into the red zone of um, the, uh, for COVID-19 cases. The red zone in football is a good thing and in, in, in for us, it's a bad thing. Um, and that indicates that there's been an increase in the number of cases in the town of Amherst uh, over the past two weeks. And we can talk more about that during the course of the, of the conversation. Thank you for those updates, Paul. I, I wanna invite um, both Jennifer and Mary Beth to also report out um, in, in their um, areas. So Jennifer, would you like to start? Yeah, so my name's Jennifer Brown. I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Um, I've been in the town as the public health nurse for seven years. So I've spoken with some of you perhaps. I'm the person that's called and asked you questions about Lyme disease or other infectious diseases. And I'm also the acting health director for a few more weeks. And then we have uh, Emma Dragon starting in November. So here to answer questions and uh, hope, uh, hope I can add to the conversation. Great, thank you. Mary Beth? Hi, everyone. Uh, if you don't know who I am, Mary Beth Ogilevitz, the Director of Senior Services, and I'm thrilled to be here in any way that we can interact and meet with the community and also answer any questions. We have now operationalized as a fully functional virtual online senior center. So it's a different experience, uh, both for our guests who used to come here, people who have questions and also for our staff. But I really just wanna to continue to message that we are open. I still get calls all the time. People are shocked that we're picking up the phone. So we're closed <laughs> to the public, but we are open and we're here every day, eight to 4.30. So, Anyone who has any questions or concerns, we are here for you. Great, thank you, Mary Beth. So um, I wanted to remind everybody in the room that we do encourage and we'd love to hear from you live. So please um, raise your hand if you wanna be welcomed into the room or pop a question into the q and I did have quite a few questions that were emailed to me um, in advance for, from people who couldn't make it. Uh, but I do see Sarah uh, with a comment and question who's with us right now live. So parents are, parents are distraught at the postponement of in-person learning because of COVID-19 outbreak among off-campus students, off-campus UMass students. Can tenants, can tenants be evicted and or property owners fined for health and safety violations? So yes, if they're true health and safety violations under the code, um, that we would go to the landlord and say, you need to fix these health and safety violations. And that has happened with some households um, in Amherst recently, actually, where the, our, our um, inspectional services department had um, made a visit uh, um, 
prompted by a different event and found some uh, safety uh, situations where they were where they said that you know to the landlord you cannot house um, people in this facility and so uh, they were told a they were given an order to fix it or evict everybody um, so and you know obviously the answer is to get it fixed as quickly as possible but that's the that's the tool that the town has thank you um, so I see a hand from Amherst neighbors before I do that I want to let everybody know this is a um, an open meeting. So um, anybody was able to join us. I do see that Western Mass News it has joined the call. So full disclosure, Western Mass News is on the call. Okay, so Amherst Neighbors, I'm going to unmute if you could introduce um, yourself and ask your question. Great. Hi, thank you. I'm Liz Welsh with Amherst Neighbors. It's nice to see all of you and I'm mm. so happy that you're doing this again. Um, and I'm and anyway, so my question, and I, it's probably becoming a moot point with the numbers going up the way they are in Amherst, but we're trying to grapple with what, under the state guidelines of phase three, step two, how does that apply to older adults? And as some of you may know, we're an organization that uh, part of our purpose, though it's not what we've been doing currently, is to provide volunteer services for older adults in Amherst. Some of those could be what we describe as non-touch services, which we're not doing now, such as things like grocery shopping or picking things up, meaning not face-to-face. -face. Um, but how, but ideally at some point wanting to get to face-to-face -face volunteer um, favors that people do for one another. Um, our volunteers are older adults. They could be anybody, but the core of them are older adults. Um, so, I just don't know how under phase three, um, stage two, what that could look like. So if anybody has any thoughts on that. Mary Beth, do you have yeah. thoughts on that? Well, you know what, what I would share is, is uh, generally uh, our approach here. So obviously, uh, Liz, as you know, we have volunteers who participate who are uh, citizens who are older adults. And um, I've also worked with another organization called RSVP, which is a yep. volunteer organization that works solely with seniors to place them in locations. And I think that the general consensus has been an increasing understanding that the risk and the health risk of isolation is mm -hmm. equally weighted as the risk of transmission of COVID. And so we have had a number of volunteers who've come forward who said, I, I have to do something. I need to do something. I need some engagement and some purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. So the way that I do it is I, I work individually, first of all, with anyone who wants to come forward as a volunteer to really have a very direct and, uh, and concerted conversation around risk assessment for themselves, making sure that they've taken into account how they feel, how their family feels, their partner, their, their bubble. Because I, I do say that I, I've often had conversations later with um, children of older adults who, who have some concerns about the older adult uh, you know, stepping into to doing something. So I, I always start with the volunteer and making sure they understand and, and they have uh, the ability to express any reticence down the line as well. And then with regard to our services, the only ways in which we are utilizing uh, volunteers out of an abundance of caution has really been ones that are contactless. That doesn't mean that they don't see each other from a distance yeah. or have the ability to have some conversation. Um, you know, we have people who are doing um, technology support <clears throat> virtually. We have folks who are delivering meals, people who are making calls so that there's plenty of social interaction. But actually sitting in closer proximity for any, you know, like more than five minutes, that's not something that we have felt, uh, given the guidelines from the state, that would be appropriate. And I would just share that generally, um, you know, that, that's been what most senior centers are doing. And I'm, and I'm happy to have a deeper conversation offline. Sure, that makes sense. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. I just don't know what the state guidelines say safer at home. I mean, yes, it's mm -hmm. safer at home, but how do we take that into consideration? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And, you know, at any point, if you have another follow up question, feel free to raise your hand again or use the Q&A uh, feature as well. We, we have a question that did get emailed that is kind of in this vein. So I'll ask that now while we're on topic. Um, a community member 
asked, are there any plans pending to resume Meals on Wheels? If so, when? It seems counterintuitive to further isolate and limit options for seniors. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that there might be a misnomer here. So Meals on Wheels has always um, gone on. We have never shut down our meals in the support of nutrition. So Meals on Wheels is actually a program that's uh, run by Highland Valley Elder Services. They enroll people if they meet their criteria. And what we do is we deliver those meals that has been consistent throughout the pandemic and people have been added to those lists. So folks who are um, homebound by their own criteria get a meal Monday through Friday delivered and that has not not uh, you know ceased for a single day. We also I, I think that the question might be more referring to our congregate meal which is our shared meal experience and again that has had to be curtailed by COVID and the way that the workaround has been a grab and gross go service. So folks come uh, to the senior center and we meet with them on the, the outdoor uh, side wall and they have their meal. And I will say the, the theory behind providing that nutritional support is, was never just nutritional support. It was around socialization. So, so the person posing the question is spot on that that's a really important function of gathering together for meals. Um, and, I, and I would share that folks who come for our grab and go, it is a very social experience. People walk over together, they drive. We, we have a lot of folks who say, you are the only person I see every day. This mm -hmm. is my one experience of socializing and that's why I come. Sometimes they don't even like the meal, but they just <laughs> pick it up because they wanna say hi to us. So, so that's an opportunity. If someone wants to participate, you can call us at 259. 3060 and we can get you enrolled within a day and um, when you come to the senior center you're just on the exterior and also that we have a number of opportunities for socializing most of our classes online include a chat feature and what i mean by a chat feature is the exercise class might be 45 minutes but then for the next 20 25 minutes folks are just saying hi and and convening online so uh, we have iPads to loan, we have volunteers helping to get people up and running with technology. So if that, if that person making the inquiry wants some assistance, please contact me and I'll make sure that you're looped in with those opportunities that, that we're uh, affording people. And then also the Amherst Neighbors is running programs. So Liz, who just spoke, they have online programs and we can help to connect you for that. Great, thank you for all that information. We'll connect that person directly with your team, Mary Beth. So again, just reminding folks, please um, raise your hand, star nine from phone or Q&A so that you can pop your questions in or come into the chat. Um, I have another question here. Do you have advice for stay, staying safe for upcoming holidays? Should I let my kids and grandkids visit? Are we able to dine together? Hmm. Well, I can add to that and then maybe Mary Beth, if you have something you can um, contribute. You know, one thing we wanna make sure is that um, people coming together um, do so if you can sort of contain sort of this bubble that we've been hearing about. If you know each other, um, you've been interacting for uh, 14 days, there's been no transmission that other people are aware of, then, then you can sort of join people together. But if you do have a lot of folks coming in from out of uh, state, then that is something to consider um, how you're going to be joining. Um, one thing is, you know, you do need to do if people are coming from out of states, um, uh, uh, um, what is the travel ban, sort of signing up for that, submitting that you're coming in, and you'll need a, a negative test before you enter this state. But other things that you can do um, if you're getting together is consider the size, where is the activity going to be, can it be outside the number of people. Mary Beth, do you have anything else you could think of? Uh, well, the only other piece that I would add is that we have technology so that if folks decide that they're not going to have their holiday and an elder is going to be home alone and the family might be doing a Zoom gathering, that we can help to facilitate that for the holiday. Mm. So that's a piece I really want people to know. Uh, we have several accounts we can, we can facilitate families gathering online. So that, that is just a, a very heartwarming and important uh, marker for everybody looking mm -hmm. into Thanksgiving. So again, any questions, contact us. And we'll see what we can do to help you. If you feel like you can't meet those parameters around uh, being with individuals who've been quarantined and safe and within a typical bubble that you have interacted with. 
It's a really good question. And, you know, each case is going to be very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so we're having that conversation in our family. Are we going to do what we normally do yeah. at Thanksgiving, or are we going to be adjusting that? Is it just going to be our immediate family? And even then, before my kids are grown, you know, before they come back, they, I, they need to be tested. And making sure tests are available to, to folks is really important. Um, but you do, we do need it. You know, we need to see our families and stuff. So it's, it's, it, there's some judgments that every individual is going to have to make in terms of what they feel comfortable with, what mm -hmm. they feel safe. And following the t trip, typical protocols of, you know, you know, we were on a call yesterday after with, with the with DPW or DPW <laughs> DPH, uh, DPW was with the power, um, and it was like, well, what what else can we be doing? And they said, double down on all the things you know: social distancing, wash your hands, wear a mask, you know, all those things. Um, you know, avoid large gatherings. They said keep pounding on those basic public health um, mantras because that's what works. And so if you are going to be gathering with a family, think about all those things that you can bring to it um, because we are going to be making, we make judgments every day about risk and this is a risk assessment that we each, every individual have to make. Great, thank you. So we have a couple more um questions that were emailed in. So I'm going to go to those next um, until I see a hand in the room or a question in the room. So this one came in um, just the other day. My husband and I are in our 70s. He wants me to stop early morning shopping at Big Y due to the rising positives in town. Um, is there evidence of increasing positives among the elderly general population? Should I be concerned? I've always felt safe in that store in the early morning. You know, I would add some of the prior conversation to the answer for this one. You know, there are several, there are many mitigation strategies that you can take and that the, the business is taking to keep people safe. Um, the businesses are cleaning high touch surfaces, they're spacing, they're doing aisles one way, there's plexiglass to keep the person behind that safe and you safe. So I, I believe if you take these strategies yourself, wearing a mask, making sure your mask fits well, cleaning your hands, um, keeping your distance from people, I believe the risk is going to be very, very low. And again, it's being balanced with what Mary Beth was talking about is socialization. You don't want to be isolated. Go get your food, take the right steps, and you can do it safely. Um, and this is stuff that we're learning now, here we are in, in October, so we're six months out and we're really, this is getting backed by science. You know, when this all came out in April and May, we were leaning on information from other illnesses, which is very pertinent and, and helps, but we know this is the way to prevent transmission. So I say go out in the morning and do shopping. <laughs> okay. And while you're out, <laughs> yeah, yeah. pick up a loaf of bread. <laughs> All right, I see um, a hand in the room, so I'm going to ask Jeff to unmute and please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, I'm <laughs> Jeff Lee, uh, Amherst resident. Um, yeah, I know that my son's soccer, uh, high school soccer season has been temporarily suspended because of Amherst being in the red zone. And I was just curious, are there other ways that Amherst is impacted? Mm. Well, the most immediate has been the sports. Uh, other schools are canceling games that they may have with um, with our students, which is a shame. And um, because the sports for a lot of um, uh, of our youth is their only outlet, and it's and um, something that's really important. Um, you know, I think in terms of other impacts, I think that just the, uh, we worry about our, the impact on our businesses because the sort of general feeling, oh, it's a red community. I think it's a, it's a very crude tool and I don't think it's a necessarily a helpful one. It, it's designed to get people's attention, which it does, yeah. but it has some, um, uh, some other consequences, which because it's such a public um, designation, um, and it doesn't take into account special circumstances. You know, we have a university here um, that that has a you know a high concentration of students. There are other communities. There's the town of Middleton has a jail in it, and they're a red community because there's there's a surge in the jail. 
you know, the North Andover has a college in its same type of, of situation. So it, it's, I don't know if it's necessarily reflective of the general community, but it's the ta it's a tag it's a designation we've been tagged with, and so again, it's the sort of more general opinion. I don't think that is necessarily um, based on health risks that people are making that decision. That's my opinion. I'm just not I'm not a health director, though. <laughs> Either of you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I would say that when this designation started, you know, uh, weeks ago, um, there, it, it just, it felt like people were going to take this as this was the one piece of information to judge, to make all our public health decisions on. And that is not the case. It's one piece. So we know our community. We know if there's transmission um, in what population. So it should be a, a conversation that we have all together with a superintendent, um, with, with other people in town. So it's one tool. But that red designation, it does catch your attention. So it seems pretty dramatic. And, and I believe that these games are being canceled not by the town of Amherst, but by the opponent, the opposing teams. Mm, oh, yeah. That's a good question. Jeff, did you have any follow-up? Uh, no, I was mainly curious if there are things that mm -hmm. can't open now because of us being in the red zone or things like that. Yeah, so, so I think we are prevented from going to, I get these phases and steps mixed up, but the only thing that happened on Octo October 5th was that restaurants could, were able to go to allow 10 people at a table instead of six. Um, bars were allowed to have people sit at the bar you know, like skateboard parks and indoor things like that, things that didn't really impact. It was a very minimal impact on on the town of Amherst. So I don't think it's significant for us. All right. So thank you, Jeff, Thanks. for your, for popping in with your question. Always, always nice to see you at our chats. I and your cat. And, and your cat. cat. <laughs> and your cat. <laughs> I want to... Um, Remind folks that we've got about six minutes left in our pre-planned um, time for this community chat. So now would be a great time to pop in with questions. And I see a hand um, from Janet. So I'm going to unmute Janet. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, Welcome. I hope. I well, first of all, let me ask you a question. Um, and that, and also, thank you for doing this and all that you are doing. Mm. Um, it's greatly appreciated. Um, but I sent a letter on behalf of District 1 Neighborhood Association this morning, and I'm so sorry that it came in late morning. Did you, did you guys get it? Did you? Um, Janet, I think, I think I did see it. It's just sort of yeah. One of many, but I believe I got it, Janet. I'm okay. And Paul, did do you? Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing it. I, I just, I'm just opening it now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, <clears throat> as we said in that letter, um, um, it was on behalf of the five of us who are on the steering team of the District One Neighborhood Association, and basically what we were saying is we so appreciate what you are doing and please keep doing those things. Mm -hmm. And then we pointed to some new things that we thought we saw in the governor's order number 52 that became effective on Monday. And we asked um, especially that um, uh, for a, an increase uh, in enforcement efforts and that was commensurate with the kind of risk that, that of, of life or uh, to people's lives or of long-term disability. So, uh, you know, there are greater fines that could be assessed. There um, are a number of things we asked for there. Um, <clears throat> that uh, basically that large gathering should be treated as super spreader events and um, to have 
the ability for the Department of Health to, de um, to call the police in um, if there's something that's jeopardizing our health. So I, I you know, and, and we pointed out, I think that um, this is always d difficult for, for town officials or government officials, but in time, you know, we, we pointed out that smoking regulations weren't popular. Everyone thought that that was going to bring the, the, the earth to an end. Um, seat belts weren't popular, but, they, but upping the ante did save lives, many, many, many thousands of lives. So um, we hope you look at our letter in greater depth. We, I know you haven't had a chance to look at it in any depth, but that you hopefully consider um, intensifying the response that in a way that's appropriate with the risk to people's lives. That's basically what we're asking. But yeah, so thanks, Janet. So I haven't read it, but we will read it in our core team meets tomorrow morning. So I'm sure we will discuss the, the things that you put in that. So thank you for going, doing that work and that's helpful to us. Um, we did meet with the university. We have a, um, our regular meeting with the university this morning and went through a number of these things. Um, um, you know, again, we want to do things that change people's behaviors and there's, um, one of the key pieces of public health strategy is to do successful contact tracing and testing. Um, and the university especially feels very strongly that, you know, maintaining compliance of, you know, willing compliance by students to participate in that process um, is crucial to, um, is, is an important factor to, for people to be able to, for us to be able to con conduct contact tracing successfully. So contact tracing, and Jen does this for a living, so she does a, a lot more, but you want people to tell you what's going on. If they were at a party, you want them to say, yes, I was at the party. Who did you talk to? Who did you spend time with? And then you follow up with those people. And that's, that's the way the system works. If students feel like there's going to be retribution against them for admitting that they've been at a party, there's a sense that that means they will not talk about things. And so, um, so it's, we're sort of weighing the two things, the sort of, um, you know, um, punitive measures, which we, some people feel would be more beneficial and, and would, would make people stop gathering versus the public health method of trying to ensure proper collection of data so we can actually address the things that are, the, the, you know, the people who are, have the disease. So that's the conundrum we have. Um, the fact of the matter is that the event, you should correct me, Jen, is, was not a large gathering that initiated this, this thing, right? Correct. Yeah, it was small. It's like eight people or something. It's so about it was eight, a, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, but all that being said, um, we also know that the weather this weekend is going to be very warm. We are having additional um, police officers and ambassadors on the street. Um, to just it, it discourage the gathering of people. It's not necessarily the size of the gathering, it's any gathering. And so we're putting more people uh, on the streets, um, especially in areas where there have been previous um, experiences of people gathering, you know, um, townhouses, one of them, but just a, a number of places throughout the community um, and just making frequent going, going by checking on if you see a party starting to, to form, intervene, start to have a conversation, um, talk about the risks and things like that. The town has issued a number, we issue numbers of uh, those fines, the $300 fines. Um, you know, I think that that's some, that, that's, you know, um, and those are basically town bylaw violation um, because of noise or non-cooperation or something like that. Um, and then the university, um, they, they, you know, these cases do get reported to the university. They review every case over the weekend or the prior week on every Monday morning. Uh, they have reported that there's 195 or something cases in, in the Dean of Students office being reviewed. Um, I don't know what the disposition of those cases are. Um, and they're not all COVID-19 violations, but they, 
they are, are handling these types of cases on a regular basis. So, Jen, do you want to talk about, oh, go ahead. I have a, a number of uh, live questions that came in from our participants. So I'm not sure if there's much more, if there's anything else on that topic, but no. I do want to oh, answer. <laughs> it's my diplomatic way of saying yeah. that. <laughs> you just say, ah, quiet down. Um, so I'm going to answer. Mike Pence. <laughs> No fly though. Um, I <laughs> so I, I will answer, ask these in the order that they came in. So um, first we have, hello, can you please tell us when and if the governor will be back up to a different phase and what this could mean for schools and local business? Thank you. And I think we have to be non-red, which is lower risk for three con consecutive weeks before we can move to a better phase. Okay, great. So another question here, is there any indication of increased community spread of, of coronavirus in the wake of the UMass outbreak or cluster? Jen? This cluster that we had um, has been defined as, I think UMass is calling it around 30 or so. We know there are more students. So those extra students, so 98% of the cases are UMass students, um, and they originated from that cluster, and they've gone out in waves and sort of generations uh, off of that, that initial small gathering. So we feel confident, say, that the transmission is through this one demographic and is not, per se, in the general population. Is that a fair description, would you say? Mm -hmm. That made sense to me, and if it makes sense to me, I hope that it makes okay. sense to everybody else. <laughs> um, but if, if that didn't um, mm -hmm. ask, answer your question, I believe it was Sarah, feel free to just pop back in. Um, I do have one more Q&A and a, a hand in the room. So we have another question here. Has there been an increase to the Department of Health budget in response to their new duties? So the, the, we, the town has CARES Act funds that can compensate for any additional costs that are related to COVID-19. So um, you know, I think we have um, engaged a couple of additional nurses to help with contact tracing yeah. and whatever the public health department needs, it, it's the top priority. But there are, we have funds in the bank ready to go for those things. And I'd like, I see a hand in the room. I'd like to welcome and invite Ava in um, if you could unmute and introduce yourself please hi i'm ava fradkin um thanks for taking my question i just when um paul when you were mentioning about um the COVID ambassadors um being around this weekend to, to discourage um gatherings i'm wondering if oh you I'm wondering if you're able to say what look, what streets they'll be on. Like, will they be on? Will that they be going to Meadow Street, Summer Street, um, out this area? Um, that's one question. Um, and then connected with that is also, will that be only be during the daylight hours, or will they also be around um, at in the evening at night to also be discouraging uh, gatherings? So um, ambassadors were, will be out. I think they go in, they're out until eight or nine at night um, again, but the police officers will also be out. Uh, they will be doing, they do uh, knock and talk where, and I think the next two afternoons, they're doing summer bridge and townhouse either this afternoon or next tomorrow afternoon. I forget what, but, but they're hitting, you know, going where they go door to door. Um, if there are pl specific places you think they should uh, do she should be email us and we'll we'll put that on their list for them to to show up that's it's a good thing for us to know um so yeah th they'll be out uh we are now answering the COVID hotline live uh until eight or nine at, at night as well and there's uh their ambassadors there and a police officer available to support them in their answering of the phone okay thank you and the email address um, just for folks in the room to use is covidconcerns at amherstma.gov. The phone line is 413-259-2425. Again, that's on our homepage and it's on our amherstcovid19.org webpage if you ever need to find that um, and reference it. So thank you, Ava, for your, for your question. So we are um, a little bit over time. I don't see any other hands or questions in the, in the chat here. So 
Um, with that being said, I'd like to invite our panelists to give any um, last statements that they maybe didn't get asked or something that you want to leave the room with. We'll pick on Paul first. Oh, no, I just want to thank everybody for being here. And um, it's a really hard time. Um, and I, again, please send us your questions because we, we do respond to them and we and it does shape how we are deploying our forces and, and, and thinking about things. So I really appreciate you reaching out to us. Absolutely, thank you. Mary Beth or, or Jen? I'll, I'll go, I'm happy to tell our, our older adults a couple of things. One, don't forget your flu shot. Um, mm -hmm. in the newsletter that's coming, I have listed all of the local places where that's gonna be available for you. Uh, CVS, Target, et cetera. If you need some information, call us 259-3060. Also, please know that we have a senior health services nurse and she is available, Karen Rainin, and her number is 259 Three two five seven. So, if you have any questions that come up, you can call, and we will make sure that we get back to you. And most importantly, stay involved. If you need ideas, call us. We can have you volunteer. We can have you connect to a program. But as the weather gets colder, it's really important to stay physically and mentally active, and we'll help you with that. So, we're here all the time. Call me anytime. Thank you, Mary Beth. Jen. You know, I want to say that I'm relatively new to this community and I see how people really care about each other here. And I just commend everybody. I know I love how we've been working together. I love hearing all the comments, you know, the information that goes to the COVID hotline because what some of those that need to come to me, they do come to me. So it does keep my finger on the pulse, you know, per se. So I appreciate hearing what people have to say. And I really learned from, from some of your comments. And then I was also going to say, remember to get your flu shot. <laughs> don't say, oh, I'm not coming in contact with anybody. I don't need it. Get it anyway. It's going to keep your, you safe, other people safe. And it builds up your antibodies for next year as well. Great, that's a, that's a good timely reminder, Jen. And I will just say one last thing. Uh, this, this chat will be put up on our YouTube channel and our community chats playlist in case you wanna reference something or share it with a friend or neighbor. Um, it'll be up there shortly and we will be back next Thursday and subsequent Thursdays at noon. We will have our, um, we will announce who our special guests are probably in the next, um, probably by tomorrow. So um, you can stay tuned and join us next Thursday as well. And I want to say thank you for everybody who's joined us and to our special guests, Mary Beth and Jen. Thank you, Thanks, Brianna. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. Have a nice day. Yeah, take care.